Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Welcome to this service of worship and Merry Christmas. We are glad that you're with us. We have a few things we want to note, just a couple of things we want to note for you as we move forward. First, thank you for being a part of this, um, what we really can't call anymore an experiment. Um, since the outbreak, we have had to um, move much more intentionally toward having an online presence um, and ministering in this way. And your participation, your um you're making use of these worship videos for your worship at home has been a very important part of our life actually at Hallfields Presbyterian Church. And so thank you very much for your participation with that. Now, in addition to that, it is um, the sun, it is the weekend of Christmas. It's also in anticipation of the coming new year. So happy new year. And as we think about that, um, Consider that Jesus himself had to be raised. So how will you take steps to raise your faith this week and into 2022? Um, don't leave him in the manger. Carry Christ with you as you move into the new year. Now, with those things in mind, let us take a deep breath, silence our devices, and continue in worship.
You know, research shows that on average, humans make about 35,000 choices in a day. In the prayer of confession, the prayer of preparation, we acknowledge the moments when our choices do not reflect God's love and we ask for grace. So let us pray together, trusting that God is with us in each of those 35,000 moments, cheering us on and guiding us home. Let us pray responsibly. We could offer welcome, but we often choose judgment. We could choose action, but we often choose silence. We could choose advocacy, but we often choose comfort. We could choose truth, but we often choose ignorance. We could choose God, but we often choose ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, for the moments when we choose, when we chose poorly. Open our hearts to choose you, to choose community, to choose love. Gratefully we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening, God. Amen. So it's finished. Um, the parties are over, the decorations stay up for a little while longer, but they're only another task now. The presents have been opened, the well-wishing's been taken care of, um, the leftovers are taking up space, and the marathon church attendance is out of the way. Whew! The songs have stopped playing on the radio, right? The Black Friday sales have already converted into inventory reduction post supply chain nightmare sales, and people are getting up for the new getting up for the New Year's um, Eve parties. Some people are getting in their last bit of traveling. Some some life continues as always. Some life will never be the same. Oh, and Jesus was born. So that's that. I mean, it's over. It'll be a while, but next October we'll be here before you know it, right? And we'll gear for Christmas again, right? But there's a lot of life that's got to happen before that. I mean, even in the time-twisted world in which the pandemic um, seems to have situated us, as fast as 2021 may have seemed to have passed for some, and as slowly as it may have for others, time still ticks away at the same pace. Experiences still collect. Life actually really does happen. And so the same thing was true for Jesus. I mean, seriously, Jesus wasn't born and then poof, Messiah, the Savior of the world, he had to wean from his mother. He had to learn his letters. He had to learn to read. He had to learn math. He had to learn his trade from Joseph. He had to learn, he had, well, he had to attend synagogue, right? And learn his Torah and Midrash. He had to learn his Jewish customs and laws, Greek commerce and Roman law. He had to learn about the difference between Jews and Samaritans. He had to learn about friendship and heartbreak, illness and death, celebrations 
and aspirations. He had to get used to his body, you know, his hair, his breath, his strengths, his weaknesses. He had to go through middle school, for God's sake. Jesus had to grow up. And the Bible doesn't really give us a lot about this. Just a sentence, really. Jesus matured in wisdom and years and in favor with God and with people. Matured in wisdom and years. I mean, wow. What do you think about that? I mean, really, think about your own life. How would you summarize the time from your birth to this moment? How do you account for all of that life? And as a part of our devotion at the December session meeting, um, our governing board, the elders were asked to summarize what they think they learned before, during, and presently during the pandemic. But look, set all of that aside, <coughs> excuse me, how would you summarize just the last week? How would you summarize the last hour? I mean, could you really say that you have matured? Now, let's be clear. We're not just talking about aging. We're talking about maturing, growing up, getting some hard knocks, learning to see things differently as you go, as you grow. How do, how do things look when you're a baby, right? But how do things look when you're a toddler? How do things look when you're in elementary school or middle school, high school? I mean, how, how do things look when you grow up in the church versus when you don't? How do things look when you grow up surrounded by people who love you? What is it like to grow up with people who wish you weren't even born? What is it like to grow up objectively poor, immensely wealthy? What's it like to grow up beaten at the drop of a hat? Or to grow up knowing that no one has a right to steal your dignity? What is it like to grow up with, with no books in the house? What is it like to grow up never having gone to school? What is it like to grow up in a world where the twin with the Twin Towers versus a world in which they don't exist anymore? What's it like to grow up wondering what you're going to have to eat versus whether or not you will actually eat? What's it like to grow up knowing that you live free enough to complain about the things that you don't like versus living in a place where complaints can get you jailed or disappeared? What's it like to grow up always close to home versus growing up moving around all the time versus growing up with no home at all? I mean, the minutes, the days, the years make all the difference. They make impressions on us. They, our, our, our experiences shape and reshape our thinking, our bias, our perspectives. We gain and lose beliefs, ideas, even our faith sometimes. And it all evolves, changes over time. And those changes come with agency, the ability to think for ourselves. I mean, to push back on our experiences and to interpret them, to, to decide for ourselves what we'll hold on to and what we'll let go of. The thing built into us, into every human being that, that exists, that calls us to choose what we'll believe about our world, our lives, ourselves. You see, Jesus, the Jesus that we celebrate, wasn't fully formed in the manger, like the months that Mary had to carry him, Jesus needed to be carried by the community around him. And that's what makes Jesus' temple encounter so interesting. We get a glimpse of Jesus choosing to define his own existence. This is Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Listen for the word of God to us all. Each year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it. Supposing that he was among their band of travelers, they journeyed on for a full day while looking for him with, among their fa family and friends. When they didn't find Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and putting questions to them. 
Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replied, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that, I was, that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother cherished every word in her heart. Jesus matured in wisdom in years and in favor with God and with people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, oddly, to really understand what's happening here, we've got to go back. And I mean way back. we got to go to Moses and the burning bush. And it may seem crazy, so just bear with me. But think about what happened there. Moses is there, and he's having this encounter with God. And while he marvels at the fact that the bush is on fire and not burning up, God calls him out and begins to share with Moses his mission to return to Egypt. And Moses balks at this, and he rightfully asks, well, who should I say sent me? And God answers, as only God can. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Now, at first glance, right, that might seem like it's a little snarky on God's part. I mean, after all, telling Moses to go back to a place that doesn't want him, to people who want to kill him, and as far as they, and, and people who don't really trust him as far as they can throw him, and then announce, well, so God sent me to bring you all out of slavery. I mean, really, asking for God's name doesn't seem like a big ask. But consider God's answer. I mean, this is the divine name, the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh. The King James says, renders it Jehovah, Yahweh. It's a weird form in Hebrew of the verb to be, and it has no equal. I mean, technically, it really means I am who I am, I will be who I will be. It means both things. In other words, Moses can't put God in a box. Moses doesn't control the narrative. At the same time, God actually shares the divine name with Moses, and that is power. In giving the divine name, God says definitively to Moses and to the people that God is saved, saving that, quote, I can do anything, be anything I want, and I'm choosing you. God chooses Israel. God chooses Moses. God chooses us. So now fast forward to the temple encounter. Think about how upsetting it must have been for Mary and Joseph. Here they are entrusted with the lifelong mission to be the parents of, excuse me, Jesus, and they lost him. <laughs> I mean, they're understandably upset and beside themselves. And so on first blush, Jesus' answer to them about where he was must have sounded snarky. But he's only laying the claim, he's only laying claim to that divine spark that's built into all of us, really, made in the image of God. We are who we are. We will be who we will be. We get to choose. Even when we feel like we have no choice, we get to choose. God shares that power with us. And so Jesus is only doing what was natural for him. He was choosing to stay with the people who engaged his questions, and he chose to stay in a place where they could talk shop about how God operates. He was expanding his world. He was futuring, furthering his knowledge. He was coming into his own. But seeing Mary and Joseph, seeing how upset they were, Jesus makes an additional choice. He chooses to recognize the home that they have tried to build for him. He chooses to acknowledge their fear and the parental need to keep tabs on him. Verse 51 simply says that he went with them and was obedient. He could have told them, back off, but he went with them. He could have pulled the Son of God card, but he was obedient. Now, at what point do you think, though, that Mary and Joseph shared that gem with Jesus, right? By the way, son, you're the Son of God and the Messiah and all that. 
Just thought you should know. Can you imagine? But Jesus chose to be at home with them, to embrace them. And I think he learned to do this from this temple encounter. So think about your own faith. Is it really the same as when you went to Sunday school? Is it really the same as when you were 20? Is it really the same as last year? What can you point to that shows that your faith is growing? What have you learned? How have you matured? Now, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, gives us a great roadmap for measuring our maturity as Christians. Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body. And be thankful, people. The word of Christ must live, must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And give thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, yeah, it's not a checklist for piety or guilt. It's, it's not a way to determine who's the best at being Christian or who's the worst. The passage is a fantastic way, though, to evaluate your own temple moments, those times when God's trying to teach us something. Seriously, y'all, consider the list. C compassion, kindness, patience, tolerance, forgiveness, love, the peace of Christ, gratitude, this, this isn't even the whole list. But these aren't things that suddenly be, that we become suddenly experts in just because we make a profession of faith. We don't just suddenly have these skills because we believe the right things. We can't cultivate a list like that in our lives without some hurt, some trial and error, a lot of error, some investment, some commitment and time. There are two truths to our walks of faith. There are the things that are always true, right? We are God's choice. We are holy and loved. And then there are the things that we work on making true for us for the rest of our lives. You know, the, that list from Colossians. We are what we are, chosen and loved, and through God's grace, we will be what we will be, compassionate, loving, forgiving, grateful. It's a process. It can't be rushed. It's far from instantaneous, and it requires more than just verbal assent. We must recognize that if we are going to claim to be Christian, to be at home with God, we can't be at home with being complacent. Our faith, y'all, must necessarily change. Our beliefs should evolve. Our understanding must expand. God should still be able to give us teachable moments. We should still be having encounters that form and reform us. Because even at a young age, Jesus teaches us what it really means to be at home with God. It means commitment to the transformation God is crafting in us every day, every moment. Jesus really is, then, the gift that keeps on giving. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Amen.
Christmas. Merry Christmas. Bye. There are many things we choose in our lives. We choose what kind of car we want, where we want to live, the career path we prefer. We choose decaf or caffeinated, AM or PM, today or tomorrow. We choose to read the book or see the movie. We choose dogs or cats. We choose where we want to give our time, our energy, and our money. So today, we are invited to choose this place, this community, this family of faith. Today, we are invited to choose generosity, trusting that God can take whatever we give and use it for good. Let us then give our tithes, our offerings, our time, ourselves, as we are able and led. Gracious God, your story is one that forever invites us to be our full selves, to take up space, to go where we feel called, and to allow this community to feel like home. To use these, so use these gifts to keep building your home here. With gratitude as tall as the ceiling, we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us continue in prayer. Holy God, we come to you today full to the brim. We are carrying gratitude and hopes, dreams and fear, scars and love. And in this moment of prayer, we give it all to you. So as we remember Jesus in the temple who felt at home there, we give you thanks for the places in our lives that have felt like home for us. Thank you, God, for the summer camps and family vacations, for crowded tables and porch swings. 
Thank you for churches that have become as familiar as a grandparent's house and for friends' homes that have become sanctuary. And as we remember Jesus in the temple who took up space to be himself, we give you thanks for the places in our lives where we have been able to follow his lead. Thank you for jobs that bring joy and for hobbies that keep passions awake. Thank you for the people who have encouraged our gifts and for those who have spoken our call out loud. We have so much to be thankful for, and yet we also know that there is still need here. So as we lift our gratitude to you for the places that feel like home and for calls that change our lives, we remember those who feel homeless. Draw near to your children who have been forced to choose a new home because they were not welcome in their own. Surround their grief and their pain with your love and give us the eyes to see and the arms to welcome them in here. And when fear draws close, pressuring us to play it small and play it safe, give us the courage to be who you call us to be. Help us to not only hear your call in our lives, but to live it, even if it surprises the ones who know us best. Remind us that there is nothing wrong with taking up space, for you gave us that space in the first place. God, there is so much good here. And there's so much we have yet to learn. Help us to be the people that create chosen homes. Help us to be people that welcome others into those safe spaces. Help us to be people who follow our calls boldly and bravely, holding open the door for others to follow suit. We come to you today, full to the brim, O oh God, with prayers that are close to home. Hold them closely. And now with the confidence of teenage Jesus in the temple, we pray your prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us say together our benediction. Even at a young age, Jesus teaches us what it really means to be at home with God. It means commitment to the transformation God is crafting in us every day, every moment. Get up. Take heart. Jesus is still calling you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Go in peace. Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria in excelsis Deo.